Hello and welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and the executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2021 New York City election cycle is well underway and it's poised to be the most significant municipal election in decades. All of city government is on the ballot and because so few incumbents are eligible to run for their current seats due to term limits, New Yorkers are electing many new office holders and the next roster of leadership for our city. There will be a new mayor of New York City elected here in 2021, as well as a new city controller, several new borough presidents, and many new city council members. And that's not all that's on the ballot. There are several incumbents eligible for and seeking re-election, including the city's public advocate. And there's a very crowded and competitive race for Manhattan District Attorney. Party primaries are set for June and the general election in the fall will culminate on November 2nd. This is the first full set of municipal elections that will feature both early voting and the new ranked choice voting system. Ranked choice voting only applies to party primaries and special elections, and we'll have a separate show just on ranked choice voting. The city election cycle would be of enormous importance under more usual circumstances, but it's unfolding at a time of great crisis for our city, raising the stakes of the decisions that you, the voter, will make. This next wave of city leadership will quite clearly make or break the city's recovery from the devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic and its many impacts on health, families, jobs, housing, education, and much, much more. It's also important to note that New York City faced a number of crises even before COVID hit, and some of those have only worsened. So it's an important time of choosing here in New York City, and we're pleased to bring you this series of interviews with candidates running for citywide offices, mayor, controller, public advocate, as well as interviews with candidates running for borough-wide offices like borough president and district attorney. And there will be debates, including for city council seats. But these one-on-one -on -one conversations will help you get to know the candidates better, learn about their values, their backgrounds, their platforms, and their vision for the office they're asking you to vote them to pursue. So we hope this and other interviews will help you sort through your many choices and make an informed decision when it's time to vote. Today, we are focused on the position of New York City Public Advocate. The Public Advocate is a citywide elected position and first in line to become mayor if there's a vacancy in that office. The Public Advocate is meant to be just that, an advocate for New Yorkers, a watchdog over city government, especially the mayoral administration and other entities that impact the people of New York City, an ombuds person who New Yorkers can go to with problems, and an official tasked with proposing solutions to make government work better for the people. The public advocate is a non-voting member of the New York City Council with the right to introduce and co-sponsor legislation there. And the public advocate appoints members to several boards and commissions, including one member to the New York City Planning Commission, for example, among several other roles, responsibilities, and powers. But one of the most important things that the public advocate has is a bully pulpit and a citywide reach. So let's talk with a candidate for public advocate. Joining me now by Zoom is Tony Herbert, who is a Democrat running to be the next public advocate of New York City. Tony, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much for being here again, Ben. Thank you. So before we get into your platform for being the next public advocate of New York mm -hmm. City, just give folks a couple minutes on your background, uh, what you've done, who you are, where you come from, uh, a little primer on you. Well, thank you so much again for the opportunity. Uh, New York, I am basically a child of Brooklyn, US of A, born and raised. Um, I'm a father of four, um, recently married. I'm actually celebrating my one year anniversary. Um, and in addition to that, you know, I've actually been very active in the community and, and, and being a good parent as well. Um, I'm a former staffer to United States Congressman in Towns. I've worked in the city council for former city council representative Priscilla Wooten. I also worked in the New York State Senate as a citywide uh, outreach coordinator for the efforts around the uh, reapportionment task force dealing with the census. Uh, culminated with the fact that I bring some Wall Street experience to, you know, to the table where I've worked for a number of banking institutions um, and also worked for an investment banking firm doing government relations work as well as small business development. Um, also had a little dip in the uh, marketing arena as well, so I understand marketing and how to get messaging out, quite frankly, um, by working for a uh, minority-owned firm called the Vita Marketing Group. 
So my experiences have brought me to a point where, although I had stopped working for elected officials, I decided that I had a lot of information um, having learned you know, from those particular positions. So I jumped out and started my own organization, which is called Advocates Without Borders. And for the last 10 years, that's what I've been out here working on, working with it, folks in the, in the community to ensure that their voices are heard. Not to say that they don't have a voice, but to help amplify their voice so that it is heard and that elected officials are doing their job, i.e. as well as these city agencies and everybody else that's supposed to do their job for the purposes of making sure that your tax dollars are working for you. So I, I, I'm in this game. I'm in this world. I'm, you know, I, I love New York. I want to make sure that New York has everything it needs to get back off the ground behind this crazy pandemic that we're coming out of. And um, I'm that guy for the job. I, you know, I'm not bought and I'm not um, controlled by any special interests. So I'm here to say that I come to work for the people. Before we get into your platform a little bit, you are one of the candidates in the in the city election cycle who is not running for an open seat, you're running to unseat an incumbent. So lay the foundation for your case against the incumbent, Jamani Williams, who's seeking re-election. Why isn't he doing the job well enough to deserve another term? Well, the job of public advocate speaks directly to being in a position to call out all of the craziness that's going on to ensure that we have access to resources and information that will allow us as New Yorkers to be able to survive. With that being said, Jamani has failed in a lot of those areas. He has not called this mayor out when needed with regards to the issues that we're dealing with, i.e., we lost $150 million. Where's that money? Jamani was silent, never asked the question of this mayor as to where that money was supposed to have gone to through Thrive NYC. Culminate that with the thought process, there's shootings going off and guns blasting in our communities. You don't see him anywhere around that stuff, but you do hear him talking about it, but you're not out there consoling the community and working directly with them. Uh, there are a number of things. I uh, blatantly just called out our school safety agents saying that they were pedophiles and, and they were out here creating um, abuse on children that work in the public school system. That's not the job of the public advocate. The public advocate is supposed to rally our city together to ensure that as a chief cheerleader, to bring everybody culturally, um, ethnically across the board into other communities where we're working together. And he's not doing that. He's playing politics to set himself up to be the next mayor or governor or whatever the other seat he's going to run for. And I think it's disingenuous to the people of our city. They need a ombudsman. They need a public advocate that's going to be on the ground and that's going to listen to them and get out here and do the job they need to get done. So we'll let uh, public advocate Williams obviously defend himself. I do think Please. there's a couple of things you said there that he would take issue with, but I'm not going to litigate that uh, for him. But um, but your your criticisms are noted, and when we have him on the show, we'll of course uh, ask him about that. that. So so what do you want to do? So you you got it a little bit there in terms of what you think the incumbent is not doing that you would do. But if Tony Herbert is elected public advocate, tell folks what that looks like. How are you approaching the job? Well, first and foremost, I'd build these bridges that need to be built and getting New York back to what it is, you know, one New York. Um, I would outreach to a number of folks by making sure that my staff is doing their due diligence to bring everybody to the table. We'll work closely with our young people to ensure that they have a voice and that they are at the table and not just having a conversation about what we think they need by hearing from them directly and them telling us what they would like. Um, I'm, I'm going to formally, and, and I think this is necessary, having worked in government and seen a lot of the bureaucracy, I will be formulating the first ever public uh, integrity bureau that will be made up of, uh, of attorneys as well as policymakers who are going to monitor exactly what's going on around the city, particularly with our agencies. Culminate that with the fact of what the city council is doing and or not doing. We'll be looking into what their discretionary money is going to be doing because we get a lot of complaints from the people in our community stating that there's no money coming in. Where are the resources? And we found just recently we've had a number of city council people who are spending money outside of their district. So the purpose is, is oh, why is that happening? Happening. So my integrity bureau would be on top of those kind of matters to make sure that there's no corruption and that the folks in the community are getting exactly what they deserve. And that's the resources that are given to their city council member to make sure that they have access to youth programming and things of that like proper housing information and education with regards to what's going on in their community. That's one of the things that I would majorly focus on outside of working very closely with our New York City public housing folks, which I've been doing for a number of years um, to ensure that those that are responsible for making sure that the resources 
resources that come into the community are getting to where they're supposed to go to in public housing. We have a program that is federally funded and supported called the um, Section 3, which makes provisions for those who live in public housing or in areas that are, you know, that are low income areas where they should have access to the jobs of the construction work that's being done inside these developments. That's not happening at all. My opponent never advocates for that. And here it is, the folks that are in the public housing divisions are saying, we need help. We want jobs. And here the jobs are, but they're not being given those opportunities. So I would focus heavily on that. And so I'm glad you brought up NYCHA. I was going to go there soon because I know that is a focus of yours. As public advocate, you have limited powers over, over NYCHA, let's say, over a lot of policy, but you do have this bully pulpit. You do have the ability, ability to propose things, to do reports, as you said, maybe to do some investigations, depending on how you, you do hiring. What's your roadmap for NYCHA? What do you think what are the big pieces that you would advocate for as public advocate to really turn around, get repairs done? What's the future of NYCHA look like if you had your druthers? Well, you know, the sad commentation, Ben, uh, with regards to um, how I've been successful thus far, not having the seat, um, is that we really just put people on blast that are not doing their job. So here it is. Um, going back about 10 years, I brought cameras into public housing, the first person to ever do that, to highlight the, the deprivation that they're living in, to highlight the, the, the conditions that they're being made to live in that are deplorable. And when by doing that and having to bring the cameras in and focus on the people that are not doing their job, all of a sudden the job gets done. So if that's what it's going to take, then I will continuously use that bully pulpit to put people on blast who have the responsibility to ensure that folks in public housing have access to clean, clean buildings, access to uh, resources to make sure that elevators are functioning because there's a big problem with elevators right now as well. There is a chance that somebody can die because of the hiring practices that NYCHA is practicing right now where it relates to getting those those who work in the mechanical area on our elevators. So there's a lot of things that I would pay attention to and bring a lot of focus on and make sure that people do their job. And I will stay there day and night if I have to. Some very, very interesting thoughts there on sort of management and job opportunities. Yes. What about the what about the 30, 40 plus billion dollars estimated that NYCHA needs for repairs and upgrades to get the many thousands of developments and, and housing uh, up to a state of good repair? There's a lot of a lot of debate over this. There's a lot of mayoral candidates this year talking about different pathways to that. NYCHA mm -hmm. itself has a plan. What do you make of that plan? What do you make of the different discussions around, do we try to just get most of it from the federal government? That seems unlikely. What, what, what's your thoughts on that? Well, you know, you know, and that's an interesting conversation. It definitely has to be some type of a, you know, private corporate, you know, kind of relationship, but not to the point or the magnitude where folks would lose their homes. Um, I, I spoke about this some years ago when I worked for the congressman, and I'm talking about going back to 83. We made a, we made a, we took a look at what was happening and the transition of taking public housing and putting it in the hands of private developers. That's a that's a disaster right there. That creates an opportunity for the developers to come in and move them out. And the next thing you know, we have a Cabrini Green inside New York City. Cabrini Green being the housing development in Chicago that was destroyed and rebuilt up to all this luxury housing. Sadly enough, that is what they're trying to do here in New York, and that's a problem. New Yorkers need somewhere affordable to live. That's the last bastion of affordable housing that we have. So it would be my intention to sound the alarm. Yes, go in and appeal to Washington to make sure that they're doing their job, but also to manifest a conversation with our state electeds and our city electeds, and let's come up with this money. We're finding money to do all these other programs. All of a sudden, the money is here, but when the federal government sends that money down, the first place they raid it from is public housing, and I'm going to put a stop to that to make sure that public housing gets its funding appropriately. And so you're against new development on nature land? or you're I'm, against, I'm, I'm, I'm against or, new development that will put people on, or displace people in public housing. As you know, I know what it's like to be homeless. I've suffered through that. You know, and the last thing you want to do is worry about having a roof over your head. And I lived as a squatter in an abandoned building because of these types of gentrification, you know, um, programs. That being said, if they're going to develop that, let's make sure that the people in public housing have the right to the apartments first at the rate that they're supposed to have it. And then, in fact, that we need to do some market rate things that the developer can make back their money on, then we can create that opportunity. But let's not push nicer residents out. Uh, education is another issue that you've mentioned that you focus on. It's obviously a huge portion of what the city budget goes towards uh, and essential city service, providing schooling for, for kids. Are there elements of how uh, education is being run in the city that you want to see changed? Are there things as public advocate that you would try to push the city towards? And as part of that, uh, the other thing I'm wondering is, are you a proponent or opponent of mayoral control of city schools that will be coming up again for renewal? 
important part of the conversation coming up in city and state policy. You know, I, I, I think mayor will control is good um, as long as there's someone watching the mayor to ensure that what's necessary is in place. And that's what the job of the, the uh, public advocate is. Um, I wanna give Misha Porter an opportunity. I, I believe that she's done some great things as a superintendent um, coming from where she's coming from. Yeah, the new school's chancellor. So I would look forward to partnering with her to ensure that the proper things are coming in place. But I would put a task force made up of the stakeholders. That would be the principals, the teachers, and some of the union folks and sit around the table on a monthly basis. And let's talk about what's going on inside the school system so that we can take that information back to the the DOE and ensure that they understand that this is coming from the ground up. That's the only way you're going to learn how to make sure that uh, the education system is working. Give our teachers the tools, allow them to teach the way they taught me coming through the public school system, going into high school. Let's let them do their job and let's not hold them to testing and all this other craziness that takes away from the kids having a real learning experience. And on top of it, let's not talk about removing school safety out of the schools. We need um, these metal detectors in these school systems as deterrents. So that people are not bringing weapons in the amount of weapons that they pulled out of our school system is ridiculous and our school safety officers do a fantastic job to keep our kids safe and we need to keep that in place so that's a perfect segue to where i wanted to head next which is public safety and policing uh you seem to be someone who has thought that some of the conversation has gone too far uh in terms of too far to the left in terms of defunding the police and as you were just saying removing school mm -hmm. safety agents that's obviously a, li a little different than removing police officers, armed police officers, you know, folks often sort of conflate those two, mm -hmm. but there's a conversation around make sure there's no armed police officers in schools. And then there's the question of the school safety agents who are not typically armed. Um, but in terms of the larger question around policing, public safety, reforming the NYPD, where do you think that conversation needs to go next? You know, I, I hear all this new terminology, reimagine and, and, and reform. All of that stuff comes to play. At the end of the day, the question of the matter is, are we safe? Are we safe here in this city? And I want to disagree with the thought process that we are. If you're looking at what's happening in our subway systems with regards to the, the, the uptick in crime there, and we just had a month going out to get milk who was shot in her head with her, you know just to go out to get milk for her two kids not to mention the same issue with one of our good friends whose father's body was found on the ground just this past weekend because of individuals who thought it was their position to take this life we need police in our community do we need to reform the concept of what policing is about i think there needs to be that conversation at the table where real stakeholders are having the opportunity and not being adversarial to the police but being at the table to have the conversations necessary so that they understand what's going on in the community and what people are feeling so that we always have a dialogue and if we can positively dialogue and not be across the table arguing and, and, and fussing with each other we can move this community in the right way i plan to be that ombudsman to be that person who has a relationship with the police to ensure that they're doing their job and the community is doing its job what's broken in that equation right now what what is it that you see sort of on the ground in communities where you've been active in various ways for decades Right. What do you see as broken? What's broken on the, the the police department side? What's broken in the community side? What's broken where the two come together? What what are the actual sort of specifics of what you see as off? Well, there's a history, um, particularly in the in the African American and Hispanic community with regards to police, and and this goes back. It predates all of us. I mean, you and I weren't even here when these problems started. So we have to get past that mantra of what that policing was all about from then. So which means the only way that's going to happen is by developing trust and building that trust. But when you have a situation where you're always constantly adversarial because you have leadership that's going out there and using that as a means to get elected, to make you afraid of something, and then they turn around and they use the police, that's the easiest tool to go after, to say the police are the bad guys. But there's only 1% of those police that are bad guys. We've got bad teachers, bad preachers. And at the end of the day, that 1% needs to be corrected and moved out. And I say this, quite frankly, I'm an African-American male. It's clear to see. But I'm not a drug dealer or a gangbanger. So you can't paint me with a brush to say that I'm like them if, in fact, that I am not. So why are we doing that with the police department? Let's give a fair opportunity to identify those officers who are doing their job. They come to do their job and just want to go home. They put their life on the line. I support that thought process. And I might have a little bias because I have a lot of family members and friends that I've gone to school with that are on the police force and who really went to do their job. But they're being painted with a negative brush. And we have to change that dynamic. And it has to work from both sides. One of the issues that is always at the center of debate these days and will be certainly moving forward is how to address the city's affordable housing picture 
uh, crisis, uh, mm -hmm. challenges around development, challenges around uh, who affordable housing is really for. Mm -hmm. As public advocate, these are debates that you'd be asked to weigh in on. Again, you have one appointment to the city planning commission where, where some of this uh, comes through, but more so again, back to the bully pulpit and the oversight mechanisms. So how are you thinking about that? Are you uh, of the mind that some put forward that what New York City really needs is to let the market build a lot more housing throughout the boroughs and therefore co sort of correct the market imbalance that has been taking place? Are you concerned that that would lead to a lot of gentrification and displacement? And if that's not the answer, then what is? Well, you know, I'm, I'm a proponent, honestly. We have a lot of property that's still out here um, that, you know, the city can still sell for a dollar. Um, what they're opting to do, and, is, and this is what this mayor's been doing, is giving it away to developers who've been building all of this uh, above market rate apartments. And now I, I kind of see a bit of a crash about to come because New York City is broke. And is broke because of COVID and is broke because of mismanagement. One of the things I've always proposed is that we have an organizational structure in place that can actually build affordable housing and be held responsible based on a task force created not only by the public advocates office, but some of the folks in the mayor's office and people in the communities that they're involved. And that's how churches, the churches can build affordable housing and manage it as long as they have the right um, task force and the right um, oversight um, organization in place to monitor to make sure that they can build affordable housing. Why are we giving all this money to the hotel industry where we can pull back from some of that and take that money and use it and build affordable housing in our communities this is a waste of money taking place right now and the city for whatever i, I mean for years we've heard the city wanted to get out of, of, out of housing you can't get out of housing if you keep allowing people to come here and they're getting on our rolls and getting monies from the city where are you going to place them except to keep putting them inside these shelters that are, that are over capacity right now. We went from a couple of years ago to just 60,000 people to almost 100,000 people in the shelter system now. And that's ridiculous and it speaks volume to the lack of work that this administration is doing. And coupled that with the fact that the, the lack of, of, of attention brought to this by my opponent, that's a problem too. We have to address this, but we have to address it from the bottom up. And we have to get people involved and engaged in this process of knowing what's going on so they have the information. I mean, just just to be clear, you know, what the de Blasio administration has often done is, um, you know, they've done rezonings of, of some neighborhoods where they allow developers to build bigger yeah. in the hopes of more market rate housing and more affordable housing that's required as, as part of that sort of density bonus. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that's a misguided policy to sort oh, of- Oh, totally. You know, I, so, I have a problem with that policy, particularly when you look at the over by the border of uh, Brownsville in East New York, where the mayor over overthrew or should I said overshadowed the community board and said, I'm doing this anyway. And the community board voted it down. Now, 50,000 people about to be displaced because this mayor and, and then council member Rafael Espinal have decided that they're going to use that area over there to build it up and yet put 50,000 people uh, you know, out on the street. That's a problem. That that fifty thousand is an estimate that that that's, a, that's an estimate that was brought to the community board by a number of community based organizations who were quite concerned about the number of homes and the folks living in that catchment area. I want to talk a little bit about the city's recovery from COVID economically, public health wise. Part of the challenge, of course, with doing that is things are moving so quickly. Things are changing. There's a vaccination effort going on. Uh, as we're talking, you know, we're getting towards spring and the weather's warming up. And we saw, you know, a year ago that a lot of conditions improved when the weather uh, improved as well and people could be outside more. But understanding that things are changing a lot, there's a big federal package where uh, a lot of money is going to be flowing into New York for, for people, for government, et cetera. Understanding things are changing. How are you thinking about the city's sort of economic revival, uh, public health? Uh, practices and policies. What do we What do we need to do coming out of these many crises of COVID to help the city recover economically and also help make sure that people are not as vulnerable to you know this type of of outbreak again? Well, I'm, I'm a major proponent of small business ownership in the city, and that's always been the backbone of any any city. 
So what I do believe that we should be offering up is some type of relief grants and helping these small businesses get back into the game um, and providing opportunities, particularly for our restaurants. And, and you know, and, and we need our nightlife back. Our nightlife brought people into this city. It brought the tourism and it, it got us excited, uh, or should I say people excited about coming here. And people have lost that because there is no nightlife in New York anymore. COVID has really done some damage, but also say that the mismanagement of money as well has created an opportunity for us to look to say, you know what, I'm going to go hang out in New Jersey now because New York is not the happening. And this is what people are saying. Sadly enough, at the same time, here we have a city uh, or should I say a state legislature that's now talking about raising taxes on us, although they just got this bonus package. So when are you going to stop beating up on New Yorkers and allow us to be able to breathe a little bit, um, knowing that you have these monies coming in, just go ahead and save our small businesses, afford us an opportunity to rebuild them up so that they can higher in the community and we can get this tax roll back and that we can be in a better position. Plus, we need to reduce the property tax issue here. If we keep ta over taxing people, you're pushing people out. New Yorkers are leaving New York and that's a problem for us. And then you push out those that can that have the money that, to be here. You're, now you want to overtax them and you're sending them to Florida and other cities as well. I want to clarify, do you think the economic reopening should have been happening on a faster timeline, sort of more things allowed to open, more more capacity? Is that, what, is that part of what you're saying? Yeah, I, I think there should be money allocated, not, you know, envisioning closing the streets over by Union Square and putting $17 million or whatever the case may be to do that, to stop cars from coming in, where you could take that same $17 million and give it to a lot of these small business owners so they can rejuvenate the tax rolls again and payroll tax so that we can get more monies in our city. Those are the kind of decisions that need to be made. We're making rash decisions, not we, but this administration. The decisions that they're making primarily on beautification and building bike lanes and all that other stuff, that, that can hold off. Let's get our businesses back up. Let's get them operating so that we can have the kind of foundation necessary for you to go do those kind of things. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the city's plan to close the Rikers Island jail complex and build these new jails that's moving ahead? It, it, you know, it's, it's unclear how much, I suppose, if there's a new mayor and a new city council that really want to pull this back and rethink it, it could be changed, but it's moving ahead as as is at least um, at least somewhat. But what do you think about that plan? And if you were elected, would you try to change anything about it? I, I would definitely fight it tooth and nail, quite frankly. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason why um, crime is up. And they've done the, what they can to try to keep people out of jail. Bail reform is, 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 is really, really needs to be tweaked. It is a problem for us. We're letting, making it a revolving door for individuals who are committing crimes to get back out and go back and commit the crimes again. So when you do arrest them, I know that the numbers are back up in Rikers Island. So people are now going to jail. With that being said, you have a recidivism rate in New York City of over 45,000 people. But you're, you're saying that you're going to build these five borough-based or four borough-based jails because you're not building one in Staten Island, um, four borough-based jails. But yet their capacity is like twenty five hundred dollars. I mean, twenty five hundred people each. If you if you reach that capacity, where are you going to put the balance of that at? Are you going to allow the people to continuously get out? Well, now we have rapes up. We have armed robberies up. We have shootings up. Um, the, they're going back to snatching chains and even snatching the hats off our Jewish brothers and sisters' heads, these very expensive hats. We're going back to the 70s. So I'm going to say, and I'm going to call it right now, this city could never, ever close Rikers Island and think that we're going to be successful with borough-based jails. Do you really think the city is headed back towards the 70s? or yes. are you, you do. I see it on the street every day. And and the the... Some some people like the current mayor have said, you know, 2020 was a perfect storm of the virus and massive job loss and people out of school and that will be able, you know, as, as schools open back up and the economy opens back up, the trends will return the other direction. You think the trend is going to continue in the wrong direction. I, and I beg to differ with this mayor, as I always do, because he just speaks politically when the gun violence in January of 2020 was on an uptick. And we didn't get hit with COVID or, or start shutting down until like March. So how are you going to say that COVID was responsible for this violence when in essence it would have you is the economy. It's the lack of those that don't have resources that you let out of jail. There's nothing out here on the street for them. And then you're forcing them to get involved to get a job. And then when you put that pressure on them, what do you think is going to happen? At the end of the day, they're going to look for a way to survive. And they're going to look for a way to stay out of jail if in fact that if you don't give them the resources, they have no other recourse. So there's unfortunately, there is a lot of mixed messages from this administration and our people are not being informed as to what's going on. And that's what I want to be, the information public advocate so that everybody can hear what's going on. All right. That's a that's a good near final thought. In our last minute here, Tony Herbert, I wanted to ask you, can you name for 
people, maybe one, maybe two political role models that you have? Are there people past or present in politics who you point to? Maybe you don't agree on everything, but you would tell voters, you know, a little bit of a signal to voters, the type of politician that you found inspiring, uh, interesting. Who, who would you name as a political role model or two? Barack Obama mm -hmm. and Shirley Chisholm. Mm -hmm. Those would be and, the two. Yeah. And, and, and what about them? Well, I mean, again, they, they, they were thought provocative. They were innovative, um, you know, for the most part. And I think they thought out of the box and it wasn't controlled by the machine. And that's the problem in our city. The machine wants to control you to do what they want so that they can make their monies and go and take care of their, their little minions. I'm about helping to make sure that the folks in New York City get what just do them. And somebody's advocating to make sure New York is getting what it deserves. Beyond this corruption, we need to get New York back where it's at and get the corruption out of our city. Okay, Tony Herbert is a candidate for public advocate. Thanks very much for taking the time. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions are coming up for New York City voters in the June primaries and the fall general election. There's a lot on the line for all of us and the future of New York City. I hope this conversation and others are helpful to you as you sort through your choices and make informed decisions when it's time to vote. I'm Ben Max. See you next time.